I think it's great when people clap and they don't know how good it's going to be or not. <laughs> what if it's or not? <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. That's uh, fantastic, the work that you all are trying to do to be the one to make all that amazing impact in people's lives. You know, the year I graduated from kindergarten, a man named James Cleveland Owens died. And James Cleveland Owens sticks out in my mind because he's the first person in a litany of people who taught me what it takes to be exceptional even when you're different. In 1936, James Cleveland Owens won four Olympic gold medals at the Berlin Olympics. The world knows him as Jesse Owens. He had such a southern accent that no one could even decipher what he was saying when he said J.C. for James Cleveland and they thought he was saying Jesse. People couldn't even get the man's name right. But today in the world of track and field, the entire landscape is very different because of the work of James Cleveland Owens. You see, in 1936, if you're not aware, it was the height of Hitler's reign in Nazi Germany, and Jesse Owens is a black man. And there were plenty of obstacles for Jesse Owens competing in 1936. There were 18 other people there that year who were also African Americans. And when they came back to the United States of America, we changed the story to say that um, Hitler was not nice to them because of their race. But what I remember, because I remember the story when James Cleveland Owens actually died, was that it was actually Hitler who congratulated him on his efforts, and it was here in the United States of America where he wasn't received, because it was 1936, and that's the way things were during that time. Now, I have a few disclaimers for you. I absolutely hate talking about this topic. I, what do I like to talk about? even more than diversity and inclusion, change management. Um, pulling your toenails out. Um, <laughs> you, you pick it. Uh, but I've been given a, a talent that I think has caused me to be the one who chooses to speak about this topic. Because many times when you say the word diversity, what people think about is what they can see. And why they think about that is because we still haven't gotten beyond what we can see. However, what Jesse Owens and a lot of other people have taught me is that whenever you are the different one, there's some things that you have to do to be exceptional, to be the one. And so my second disclaimer is that in an hour, I am likely to say something that's going to piss you off. <laughs> <laughs> Try not to focus on that, please. It's, it's your first assignment. When you're thinking about working with difference, find the places where we agree and let's start there. Agreed? Okay, and then my final disclaimer is I don't know that I'm gonna tell you anything you don't already know. It's just my hope that at the end of today with what I'm talking about and what others are sharing that you'll think about what you know very, very differently. Fair enough? Okay, so in order to get a few things out of the way, I don't know if I can take that out. Yeah, I can. I have a little exercise for you, and I, is this like church? Any of y'all go to church? Some of you? Okay, so for the rest of you heathens who don't. <laughs> when I say something at church and you agree, you have to kind of say something back. That's kind of how it works. And so we're going to do an exercise. IT people even in the far back corner back there. <laughs> I'm going to ask you some questions. We're not going to talk about it. I just need you to respond, OK? Fair enough? All right, so I've got a slide I'm going to put up. And I want you to tell me which group is more powerful. I don't want you to think about how you would hope for the world to be. I want you to tell me based on your experiences, and not just in your small corner of the world. Just in general, first blush, which group is more powerful? Everybody clear? OK, perfect. All right, so let's go. Married or single? Married. Children or adults? adults. LGBT or straight? straight. Poor or rich? rich? Men or women? Men. If you were born in an urban environment or the country? Urban. A GED or college degree? college degree? 
So we didn't have to talk about that, did we? It just is. And what I want you to, to think about is just because we acknowledge privilege doesn't mean we agree with it, that we think in the long term it should be, that we're not doing anything to maybe impact it. It just is. So it takes me to my very first invitation for you, and that is to acknowledge what is. There's so many times when I'm working in, um, in organizations that I will hear people say things like, I don't see color. Well, if you haven't noticed, I'm brown. <laughs> Just because you notice means nothing. Now, if you treat me differently, then we have something to talk about. But just because you notice means nothing. If you walked in this room and everyone had red hair, would you notice? Yes, and so if you say that you don't see color, it's kind of like lying and we all know you are. <laughs> so trust goes down. And we don't want trust to go down, we want trust to go up. And so simply acknowledge, acknowledge what is. I do care about who people love. I ask them all the time about their spouses, about their children. I do care. And so to say, I don't care about who you love, eh, for the people you work with every day, we do care. We do care. And so first invitation, please acknowledge what is. So let me ask you this. When you first came on the planet, and you can just shout it out, who taught you how to be? Who told you what was socially acceptable? Yes. Your parents, your mom? Yes. Grandparents, I'm listening. Teachers, school, other kids, church, they're always right. We talked about that. <laughs> TV, media, I learned something different if I was born in the country versus if I was born in the city, yes? Yeah, Mr. Henry, my babysitter, taught me a lot about smoking cigars and eating pancakes. He's a fantastic gentleman. <laughs> that cigar thing's in right now. I don't know how that happened. We all have inputs. Is it likely that any of us have the exact same inputs? Even if you're my sister, you're my sister, I'm your sister, so different inputs. And what tends to happen over time is if I agree with my father and I like him a lot, the things he says I bring closer to the vest. If my mother's a moron, <laughs> I'm not gonna listen to her. How many of you have siblings? How many of you know who your parents' favorite is? Yes! <laughs> we know how this stuff works, right? There's some people we like a little better than others. So the longer I live, what do I start to do? I pull things closer, I push things farther away, I pull things closer, I push things farther away, until I have a very solidified filter through which I see the world. And these things are common to all of us. Every single last one of us have these. And so if you do something that I like, guess what? I go back to my peeps and I go, oh my goodness, Susan, she's amazing. Have you seen this one? <laughs> she likes orange shirts just like I do. And so when someone comes to me and they have something, they, they say, have you, did you hear what Susan did? I'll go, what, Susan, I love her, what'd she do? <laughs> And so eventually the conversation changes and it works perfectly when we all are in agreement. But Martha, <laughs> Martha and I, we love each other. We had a great time when we, we, we're good. So this is just for demonstration purposes, okay? <laughs> Me and Martha, we're good. Don't, nobody, don't go to HR and say, what about Martha's feelings? <laughs> Martha, we're good. This is just an example. Let's say Martha does something I don't like. Am I going to go talk to Martha, people who like Martha, to see why she did it? Oh, no. I'm going to go back to my desk, and there's going to be an article in my email inbox from Harvard Business Review that says, Martha is a moron. <laughs> That's my first data point. Because we like data, don't we? So then I'll go back to my filter, the one I've solidified, and I'll ask those people. Can you believe that Martha did this thing? And what are my peeps going to say? What's wrong with her? <laughs> Martha. 
Then I'm watching my favorite news channel, you know, national news. We watch all of the channels. We don't have favorites, right? So I'm watching all of them, especially my favorite. <laughs> and there's someone on television, there's, there's a credible. This is an expert about how you're supposed to do things in credit union institutions, right? And it's different from what Martha did. And so now that's my third data point. So now I have told myself that Martha, there's something wrong with her. <laughs> and me, I'm right. What's the problem with my logic? I, one, I didn't even talk to the source. I didn't ask Martha, right? We talk so far, we talk far more about people than we do to them and expect things to change. That's number one. The second thing is, I chose what articles I want to get in my email inbox. I chose my friends. I also chose what news station I wanted to watch. If I want to improve my relationship with Martha and she's different from me, I should check what Martha's reading. I should ask Martha's friends. I should watch the news channels Martha watches. Because if I think what you think, I will do what you do. Period. Period. And we separate ourselves based on difference. It's the human condition. I'm not judging. I do this too, every single day. In fact, I screw it up a lot. I'll, confession, may I confess? <laughs> when I was told that the CEO was speaking before me, what pronoun do you think I used? <laughs> Knowing that I didn't know it was Carla. He. 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 Carl doesn't look much like a he at all. <laughs> so even I do this. So I'm, I want you to know that as I'm talking, that this I'm standing here in complete non-judgment. It's the way we make short men mental shortcuts. Our brain does it quickly to decipher. And I just want us to be more aware, because the more aware we are, the better we're able to do all those amazing things that you all just say you're going to do for the community here in Spokane. Make sense? OK. Yes. So whenever we have someone new join our team, and I hear in the last, I don't know, five years, you all have added like 100 people. Is that, is that right? It's a huge number, growing pretty fast. When things go really well, somebody new comes on board. Is it likely that they don't know how things work here? Yeah, OK. Next one. I love this. This is, work, this is working flawlessly. So somebody who's not worked at Numerica before, they're going to make some mistakes, yes? Yeah, and so when they make mistakes, if they're mostly like us, what are we going to do? One more, Jamie. We give them feedback. We'll say, hey, listen, let me pull you to the side. That's, this is how we do it here. This is what you could, should consider so you could be more successful here. They say good, they hear the feedback, and they make some course correction. So when they make the course correction, they make the adjustments, not that they assimilate, they still bring their amazing difference to the organization, but they've made the small little changes to make them a Numerica employee. That's what it looks like when it works well. Now let's introduce difference. Someone who doesn't quite fit the mold of what we're used to seeing. So we introduce difference. Everybody's excited. No, everybody's nervous. <laughs> Everybody's nervous. We're like, oh crap, now I need to read up on PC culture, make sure I don't say anything weird. All right? <laughs> Let's go up. So, just like new people who have worked other places, they're going to make mistakes. But now, when they make mistakes, the feedback is not as clear. Because I don't want you to think it's about that different thing you got going on. <laughs> So I might not say anything, OK? So you're not going to give me feedback. Or if you do, it's going to be real subtle. So I told you I was a, um, or Carla said I'm an engineer by a degree. Uh, don't hold that against me. My personality completely disagrees. <laughs> so when I walked into a manufacturing plant, in all my awesomeness, <laughs> I dressed just like this, pretty much. Everybody else wore khakis and polo shirts, but I didn't notice. 
And so I, what I should tell you though, is that I was also the only black person at that plant. I was also the only female working in that plant leadership and I was also the only one under 30 and I was under 25. So just background information. So after I'm saving millions of dollars of my first year and then I get my performance review and it's not what I want it to be, I'm like, what the heck? What do you think I'm attributing it to? All this awesomeness. <laughs> Like, what's wrong with them, you know? They must be all those ist. That's what I'm telling people. My leader, his name is Dave Saunders, and Dave and I have a fantastic relationship at the, now we do. <laughs> Y'all picked up on that. Oops. So at the time, people would do subtle things. They'd say, oh, nice skirt. Or that's an interesting choice of shoes. But here's the thing, the only rule was closed-toed shoes. It was the only rule. If you went on a production floor, you had to have on steel toe shoes. Otherwise, there was no rule. So I still walked in with my orange necklace because what? What's the deal? Here's what was happening on Dave's end. People were not believing in my credibility because I wasn't dressed like an engineer. Now, I know that might sound ridiculous, but think for a moment. If your lawyer came to court dressed like a construction worker, <laughs> you'd be wanting to change lawyers, wouldn't you? <laughs> there is some credibility associated with certain professions and the way people dress, as much as we might not like it. Here's what I would have loved to happen if Dave and I could go back to those years Hey, Nicole, wear whatever you like. But I need you to know that people associate khakis and polos with credibility. And you have an extra hurdle to jump when you come in wearing a pink skirt. <laughs> Do whatever you want. I don't care. I just want you to be successful here. And once you get to a position of uh, leadership, then you can change the dress code all you want. But that's not what he said. He said something that I can't even tell you what it is today because it was just covered with so many pillows and nuances and I don't know what he said. And so because I didn't get feedback, next Jamie, <laughs> I kept wearing the same stuff, my behavior continued, and I was never able to get to the level of technical leadership that I wanted to in that organization. Now today I know that was somebody looking out for me perfectly. Um, I should not be a plant manager. However, at the time, that's what I did think I wanted to do. And so what is the issue? What's the ultimate issue? One more. Should I get somebody else? <laughs> should I get somebody else? When we're talking about... <laughs> I love you, Jamie. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Lack of feedback is a big problem as it relates to dealing with people with difference because we're extra nervous about it. We already don't like giving feedback. Have you all heard of this like uh, feedback is a gift? <laughs> Have you heard that? It's like, yeah, the gift I want to re-gift. Nobody wants some feedback. <laughs> Whenever someone says, do you want my feedback? What's coming? We're like, oh God, <laughs> what now? So then layer on all the other stuff that we've kind of separated ourselves with. And now feedback is just laborious and I'd rather pull my teeth out with spoons <laughs> than to give feedback. So let's talk about, I'm gonna share with you just a simple tool to make feedback a little easier to give and to receive. It's the number's ridiculous. I think you can make up stats. Did you know that people make up stats all the time? <laughs> but the worst number I've seen is like 76% of people say that they don't like giving feedback to a peer. So it's pretty common. So here's a tool to be able to help you. And I got this from Alan Fine. He wrote a book called You Already Know How to Be Great. So many times when people are doing something that is good or bad, they already know that it's good or bad. So if you ask me, how am I doing towards my healthy eating goal? 
I don't need you to tell me that I don't eat right. <laughs> I already know that I don't eat right. How many of you already know you don't eat right? Do you need to go to a dietitian to tell you not to eat, to eat better? No, but we still pay and go to trainers and do all those things. So in the same spirit, spirit, many times people already know where things have gone wrong. And so a way that you take down the defenses is that you ask them, what do you think worked well? And hear what they have to say. Because here's the thing, you're probably in agreement. And then you don't have to say anything. Isn't that fantastic? <laughs> then you say, okay, where'd you get stuck? Not where, where'd you go wrong, but where'd you get stuck? Because again, people likely already know where they're getting stuck. And then third, if you had a chance to do it over, what would you do differently? Now, sometimes when you ask these questions, the person doesn't agree with you. But you'll find that many times you're pretty close. You're pretty close. And so that long list of feedback that you had to give has now gotten much shorter and a little easier. Well, you know what? I agree with you. This, these are the two, three, two or three things I think went well. You know, one place where I'm getting stuck is, I agree with you that yes, you came on time. However, you were two hours early, which then made it really uncomfortable for the people who were trying to get prepared. If you were gonna do it differently, I'd say stick to maybe 30 to 45 minutes early. But see, at, once I've already asked you, you've given me enough information and content to see where we're already in agreement and where I need to provide additional information. Spectacular book, he's not paying me for that plug if you wanna pick it up. You already know how to be great. When I'm new, I don't need coaching. See, coaching is about me helping you to uncover insights that you might already have inside, but when I'm new to your culture, I don't know the little nuances that you have here. So I need your advice, even if it's ridiculous, like don't wear pink skirts. So then I know what people are thinking. Well, what about political correctness? <clears throat> Second invitation, you can be honest and kind. I talk to people and they go, oh, they just can't handle the truth. Well, no, when you're shooting it out of a Uzi. The truth hurts pretty bad when you're giving it to me that way. <laughs> Put a little sugar on it, please. Thank you. We think that if we're honest, then somehow we have to be mean. And on the flip side of that, if I'm kind, then I don't have to be honest. It's like, can we find that middle ground where I can put a little tact with my messages? It's an invitation. You don't have to do anything I ask. It's just an invitation to see how it might help you and the people you work with be their better selves. So what about political correctness and PC culture? Let me tell you why, in general, we tend to lean towards political correctness versus just honest, tactful dialogue. Few reasons. Number one, you have to be able to trust yourself. You see, if I know that I have biases, but I'm not, especially if they are overt biases, I don't trust what might come out of my mouth. And so that's why I need to be politically correct, because I don't trust myself. It has nothing to do with you and your feelings. It has to do with what if there's a hot mic? <laughs> Secondly, many of us are fully unaware of our unconscious biases. If I were to ask people about the things that they're biased against as it relates to age, most people are generally overtly biased against young people. Now, how do I know? These young people today, oh my God, have you had to work for a millennial? Have you seen them? They want a little work-life balance and they want to actually see their families. Novel ideas. <laughs> you can find articles anywhere that say, oh my God, these young people, do something about them. It's like conscious bias against youth. But you want to know how I know that's not real bias? Because we spend far more money on hair care products to make sure you can't see my gray. Hair care products to try to grow a little bit more hair. Wrinkle-free cream. Nip and tucks. 
all things to prevent getting older. So subconsciously, we're biased against getting old. But consciously, we're biased against youth. And it's important to know what you're subconsciously biased about because you can't, you can't fix it if you don't know what it is. You cannot fix it if you don't know what it is. The other thing I would say is check your motive. Why are you being politically correct? What's your reason? Is it to make you feel more comfortable or is it because you're worried about the other person? And if you check your motives and you feel like you're in a good place, then go forward with what you have to say. And then finally, when things, issues of difference come up, here's what we do. We get far away from it. When I don't know what, it's, what it is, when I'm uncomfortable with it, I separate myself. What you need to do is get close. The more you are, feel different and it's something you have to interact with every day, you got to dig in and learn more about it. There's some things that make me horribly uncomfortable. The death penalty is one of them. It makes me horribly, horribly uncomfortable. But if that's something that is important to someone else who might be a client or a customer or someone I say I love, I need to get close. I need to read. I need to find out because the people in my circle have no idea. And as I've done that, I've learned that there's like a 30% error rate in terms of whether or not people are guilty or not. If I was at a 30% error rate with cutting off the right leg and I'm a surgeon, are you gonna pick me? Probably not. And so it's changed my opinions about that. But why? Because I chose to get close, not just because I was sitting in my regular old home, never affected by the death penalty. Does this make sense at all? Okay. So here's what I want you to, to know, that there's some problems we've had for a really long time that we can absolutely solve if we change our mindsets. And part of the way that we can change our mindset is to know what our unconscious biases are. So I usually put a, a little picture in my presentation of my friend Stacy. My friend Stacy and I, we've been friends for 20 years, and Stacy's about 300 pounds overweight. He's the most, the smartest man I know, and if I was ever starting a major project, he's my go-to guy, Stacy. When I took an implicit association test, I learned that I was biased against heavy people, and I was mortified. Because how could this be? My mama's heavy. My Stacy, my best friend's heavy. You, you, did y'all just hear what I just did there? <laughs> it's terrible. But that's just the thing about subconscious bias. You don't necessarily know that it's happening to you. It's the media. It's your environment. It's all of us have these subconscious biases going on. So what did I do about that? I said, OK, I'm going to get close to this thing. And I'm going to start paying more attention to this one thing. And so two years ago, one, one thing I started doing, if I'm on an airplane where they have open seating, where you can sit anywhere, I sit next to the person who's heavy. The seat where nobody else wants to sit for their own personal comfort or whatever. And doing that, what I've had a chance to do is hear how terrible we can be towards people who are heavy. Now, did I do that just so I could like ruin my own life? I was happy in my ignorance. No, I did that so I could make the small, take the small steps necessary to make sure that I live being a better person towards everyone, regardless of what they weigh. So on the flip side of unconscious bias, and you have an assignment, I want each of you to go to um, implicit.org. Implicit.org. Project Implicit. I'm sorry, it's projectimplicit.org. And take at least two implicit association tests. And you'll have this slide deck too in case um, you forget to take notes. Because I want you to do something about one of them. I want you to do something about one of them, just one. Because in today's environment, in spite of what you hear across the national news, 
most of us are really good people and we're not showing up with hateful language and speech and treating people overtly bad, poorly. We're doing subtle things, subtle things. Like, do you pay attention to what someone's eating if you think that they weigh more than you think they should? It's a subtle thing. And so I ask people, what's worse, a shark bite or a mosquito bite? And most people go, a shark bite, of course. But what, like eight people have gotten bitten by sharks in the last couple years? How many people die from mosquito-borne illnesses? Lots, and that's because, I like to use that example because stress is cumulative. If somebody does something egregiously wrong, like calls me a bad name or treats me poorly, the world comes to my defense and they say, that person's a moron. But if you just don't say hello to me, what do I look like telling someone you didn't say hello to me? Or what if you just consistently get my name wrong? Over time, those small little things like that, and we call it political correctness, and we say everyone's so sensitive about everything, that's because everybody gets your name right. But what does it look like every day if people aren't saying hello to me, they're asking me, telling weird jokes, looking at my play, not getting my name right. It's the small things that we need to be more concerned about. The big things, we've got that covered. The little things, we say, eh, we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Examples of some micro inequities. There was a gentleman who worked on my team, and he was a sales guy, and he was a very, very good project manager. This team that I worked for, though, oh my God, like hurting cats. These people were not good project managers. So we were hiring him specifically for his project management skills. Now that was wonderful until he started project managing me, right? So when he's bringing his little Gantt charts and he's telling everybody else when they need to be on time, I'm good. Until he starts calling me about my projects and when my projects are going to be on time. Now I'm mad. So at staff meeting, am I overtly mean to him? No, it's just when he starts talking, I go, oh. I don't even look at him. He's over here, I'm like. <laughs> How many of you are in loving relationships? If you're married, raise your hands too. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever noticed that when you're mad at your spouse or partner, how you won't look them in the eye? Have you ever noticed that? That's because your brain is doing something very helpful to you. You're going to fall back in love if you look at them. <laughs> and you want to be mad. And we do this at work too. Notice how when there's someone whose their personality is just a little different from yours or it's in a group that there's usually some contention, how you just avoid looking at them when they come and talk to you. I'm going to pick on the IT table back there again. So when I went over there this morning to say hello, all the rest of you were like, hey, how you doing? Good to meet you. They didn't even turn around. <laughs> They're like, hi. <laughs> One beautiful spirit over there said, I'm trying to sit by the window. Can you leave me alone? I know exactly what that is. So I don't, I'm not offended, but I want you all, like all of us, to be aware of how we do it. So when I know that I'm purposely, I can feel myself like not looking at someone, I make an intentional effort to look them in the eye. Because that's my body doing that thing where I'm like, mm-mm. <laughs> Gently excluding people from social gatherings that we've all you know, been a part of or not introducing people when we normally would. Now, is there something we can do about that? Absolutely. Micro affirmations, just like you can do small things, that dis disenfranchise people, they are really small things that also have a huge impact. They're very cumulative. So let's talk about what those are. First, I invited you this morning to be aware. So one, just acknowledge what is and be aware. So I should probably add an A. But secondly, let go. Like, try not to judge people. Our, in our initial reaction is judgment. I know one time there was a guy behind me um, coming into a hotel lobby and I didn't hold the door for him and he was appalled because he had luggage. Now, love him, fantastic, but what you need to know about Southern culture, 
I don't hold the door for you. You should be holding the door for me, even if you have luggage. That's just how that goes. <laughs> and so because we don't know each other and we don't know what the reason was for me not holding the door open, where does our brain go? He goes, I'm rude. And I go, he's rude. <laughs> you see how we do that? But it's like if you have no idea which, what somebody else is thinking, you have no idea. Let's assume positive intent. Fill it in with good. This is not positive psychology. It's if you don't know, fill it in with good. And there's so many times we have no idea what someone's thinking or why they didn't hold the door. Somebody walks past me in the hallway, they don't say hello, we go rude. <laughs> Next time I see them in the hallway, I don't speak to them, and then they don't speak to me, and then I say, see, I'm right, they're rude. <laughs> but what if they're meditating for peace and joy in the world? I don't know. There's no way to know. Why someone didn't say hello to you. There's physicists who say they didn't even walk past you in the hallway. So, <laughs> let go. You might be right, you might be wrong, there's no way to know. The second thing is involve. Invite people to participate. If there's, allow people the option of opting out instead of you being exclusionary. Please don't assume for me that there's certain things I don't want to do. Invite, if the team gets together to do something, I don't know, on the weekends or whatever, invite me. It's simple, it's a small thing. Uh, value. Another thing that happens to people who are different is we tend to take credit for their work. Be sure to give credit where credit is due. I'm not sure why I got a laughter up here, but somebody's had this happen to them, I think. <laughs> then finally, be expressive. Be friendly, make eye contact, and then ask everyone for their input. And this takes effort, but it's small effort. And why do we care about such small things, Jamie? We care about small, such small things because it's a way for us to in, in, increase the number of people and the types of people who are in our network. If you have a piece of paper in front of you, I want you to do a quick exercise for me. Who's your go-to person if you've got a new project? Write their name down. New project, you've got a go-to person, write their name down. This is not party time. This is not party time. What you doing? Okay, you got that person? All right, next one. You need someone to help you with a strategic plan. Who's your go-to person? You need a strategy. You need to put together a strategy. You're sad and you need somebody to cheer you up. Who's your go-to person? Write your name down. All right, one last one. You have something that's incredibly confidential. You're not supposed to tell anyone, but there's some one person you know you can trust. Who's that person? Write their name down. Anywhere. It, somebody asked, is it at work or anywhere? It can be, it can be anywhere. They're like, wait, I got different people. Okay, you got it? Everybody got somebody on their list? Even if you're missing a couple, it's okay. What I want you to do is look at your list. How are these people different? Like when you just look at the things we t tend to check, race, gender, sexual orientation, are they religious or not, are they young or old, do they have college degrees or not, how are they different? Because if you're like most people, the list is pretty darn homogeneous. And all I would ask you is that in the incredible work that you have to do every day, We've got to just think about who else might be available to play some of these roles in our lives. Who else might be available? The persistent challenges that we continue to have are because we haven't given much thought to it. I fundamentally believe that most people are not waking up every day trying to figure out how they can make your life miserable. <laughs> I fundamentally believe that, that everybody's coming to work to have a good day. That's what I believe. I believe that. And I think when people wake up in the morning, they just want to have a good day. So I don't think it's deliberate. It's mental shortcuts. Remember, I got my filter. I end up with my peeps. It's just how it happens. 
So just be more thoughtful. To be a better human requires that we're a little more thoughtful about some of these things. Okay. Well, what about accountability? Now, here's where I'm going to conflate issues a little bit. And I hate when people conflate issues. But I'm going to conflate issues. We have been talking about the circumstances, right, and how all of us can make the circumstances better. But there's this other thing that sometimes we don't talk about. You see, Jesse Owens, it would have been nice if we could have made the circumstances perfect for him, wouldn't it? Would have been fantastic. Jesse Owens wouldn't have four Olympic gold medals in 1936 if he needed perfect circumstances. Because you see, your circumstances are not the reasons why you can't su succeed. They're the reality in which you must. And that's where accountability comes. Jesse Owens had to be the fastest man in the world so that when he had the opportunity, he could win. So that's where accountability comes in. But it's not, is the, are the, is the environment good or are you accountable? It's both, and I do realize I'm conflating issues, but they are both incredibly important. So let's talk about what that looks like. If I put fleas in a glass, they'll all jump out. But if I put fleas in a glass and I put a lid on that glass, the fleas will jump up and hit their bodies against that lid really hard until they realize that it hurts and there's a lid there. Once I have 100% compliance and the fleas are jumping just below the lid, I can take the lid off. And the fleas will never jump out of the glass. Do they have the ability? Yeah, but they don't. But here's the most amazing thing about Learned helplessness, that's what this phenomenon is called. Even the offspring of these fleas will never jump out of the glass. Sometimes there are real obstacles. Other times they're just ones we're imagining. Other times they're just ones we're imagining. So first things first, be certain the lid is off. If you have the ability, every last one of us in some area of our lives, we have power and privilege. We must make sure the lid's off. But now, sometimes the lid's gonna be on. And if it is, and you happen to be the different one, if you are unorthodox, you must be exceptional. I can walk into a manufacturing plant with a pink skirt, but guess what? I better be darn good at what I'm doing if I'm not going to follow the social norms. Because all things being equal, we just like to pick people who are like us. And if you're gonna be all different, don't come being all different and all average. <laughs> I know, I hate this, but it, it is true. So if you are the, the different one ever, Here's what I want you to remember. There's four things. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Number one, all of us are on this planet for a unique reason, just as fleas have the ability to jump. Every single person has a purpose. And so there's some, several things that I want you to make sure you ask yourself when you show up at work every day. What's my individual purpose? Why am I here? Did I just happen to be here? Because let me tell you what, if you just happen to be here, you'll be looking for somebody else to increase your engagement all the time, and it ain't gonna happen. When you do the work you're purposed to do, when you get tired, when the environment's not exactly how you want it to be, you will give the discretionary effort necessary to reach your goal. It's engagement, that's what we measure in HR. Secondly, what's your passion? What's that thing that you would do anyway? Even if you could do it for a job or not, what's that thing? And are there some transferable skills there? So I would absolutely love to be a comedian. I don't want to do that, but I get a little bit, if you notice, I slot a few jokes in <laughs> because they're transferable skills. So what's that thing you would do anyway? And what are some ways that you can use that in your, in your work so that you can get some joy and love there? And then lastly, skill. What's your prowess? Sometimes if we've got good purpose and good passion, we won't do the extra work to be exceptional because I can do kind of bare minimum and get by when you compare me to everybody else, you know? But if it takes 10,000 hours worth of practice to be really skilled at something, it doesn't exclude us. It doesn't exclude us. If you are unorthodox, you must be exceptional. Number two, every once in a while, somebody's going to place a lid or two in your way. Obstacles will come. 
If you can get your work done with no obstacles, whoop-de-doo. <laughs> Wonderful for you, but we're going to run into challenges. And when you run into challenge, challenges, resilience is incredibly necessary in order to get to the goal you want to get to. Because here's what I want you to know. Many times organizations pay for me to come in, and I think that folks think that this is about what's good for their organization, so what would be good for you all here. But if you take on these four ideas, it'll make you a happier person. This is about you. Now, you being a happier person makes work a better place to work. So that's kind of the consolation prize. But my life's work is that everyone is living fully into their purpose, period. And if you employ these ideas that I control my destiny, nobody else, happier you. Happier you. Because let me tell you, I could give you a long list of reasons why things are going to hell in a hand basket. And I'd be right about all of them. But the next question is, how happy am I? Lids do not have to result in disengagement or unhappiness or anything negative. It is, what can I do in the meantime? Because this, I think this is interesting, too. When there's a lid on, the fleas are still jumping. They know they can't get out, but they're still jumping. We have to prepare ourselves for when opportunities come. Does it make sense? All right. Number three, we all in some area of our lives have power, privilege, and influence, even if you just happen to be an adult and someone is a child. Now, what I've noticed, because I pay attention to this all the time, is that typically when we have power, we abuse it. Just humans. Notice the way that we teach, that we treat children. Pay attention to how we treat children. And it's one of the areas where when I'm talking to adults, where we all have that common area of power and influence. And since we all have that area of power and influence, we have a responsibility to remove lids where we can. Because it's so easy to go, well, what about me? and everything else that someone else is doing, but I can tell you that if someone's got a lid on you, you're likely to put a lid on someone else. It's how people act who've been oppressed. We hold other people down. And if we want to get to the best of places in the world, it's like, let's just remove lids for everybody. What could we possibly accomplish? And then finally, Many of the obstacles that we believe to be true are ones we just made up in our own brains. How many times has there been um, a record that's been broken and we say, oh, nobody's ever gonna beat that record. And then someone in their mind goes, I can run a four minute mile, and then it happens. If you believe it's possible or impossible, you are 100% right. Belief in the brain is a big deal. Now, I want to remind you, if you just take this part of the presentation and go running with it, it's half the message. We have a responsibility to work on the climate. When someone's coming into my area and they need my help, how do I act then? The work climate is incredibly important. And accountability is incredibly important. It's not a competence issue. People have the competence to do what they, we won't need them to do. It's a confidence issue. Can fleas jump out of glasses? Absolutely. But they've run into obstacles over and over and over again that now they told themselves they can't. And the same is absolutely true for humans as well. We suffer from learned helplessness as well. So one final thought is that I want you to know that if you come to work and you're happy, that's your choice. If you come to work and you're unhappy, many times that's also your choice. Well, Nicole, my leader, whew, have you seen this woman? Well, let me tell you what, if you can only be successful with a good leader, that is not a good strategy. You know why? Half the people in the world don't wanna be leaders, so you got pretty high chances that at some point in a long career, you're gonna have a bad one. And I want you to be successful with good ones or bad ones. And so all the strategies that I told you about when someone is needs micro affirmations, try them with a bad leader and see what happens.
Call me and tell me about it. <laughs> Finally, this last thought. I wish the world were a perfect place. It's not. There's so much incredible work that needs to be done. But if each person just decides, I'm going to move the needle a little bit, we have the propensity to move it. Malcolm Gladwell says you only need 26% of people to buy into an idea before you tip the culture in favor of where you want it to go. And we tend to think, oh, i got to have everybody on board. No, no, no. Just 26%. And then it's this tipping point. So start where you are. You don't need to be in a far out better place. Where you are, what's the one thing you can do? And I hope that you all take my invitation to take the Harvard Implicit Association test and see where you are with that. Use the skills and abilities that you've personally been given and do what you can in your area of influence. Nobody's asking you to go take in Syrian refugees if that's not your thing. But when someone walks into your branch and they your brain says, oh my gosh, they don't have the money. Just pay attention to that. Pay attention to that voice and ask yourself, why am I saying that? Well, let me go through the process anyway, because I might be wrong. Let me be kind anyway, because I might be wrong. Fair enough? You all have been fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Would you put the last one up? What time is it? We have plenty of time for some questions. And then I know Carla told you to put your phones away, but you all can absolutely tweet and Snapchat me. I look good today. <laughs> Any specific questions at all? I wanted to make sure I left time for that. Are we not going to get any questions? <laughs> I, was on, I was on film. Is, a question? No? Well, th that was an IT person I pointed to. <laughs> no, I really don't know. I just made that up. Zero questions? Oh, yes, my dear. Okay, so my, my journey. So I am a chemical engineer because I'm good in science and math. And um, my teacher said that engineering would pay my way. And it did. I had a full scholarship. And it never even occurred to me. I, first of all, I didn't know what an engineer does. Let's just talk about that. <laughs> and then I, I went to engineering school. And it should have been obvious to me that I was very different. But I just assumed that they were making it up. So for example, um, I had a friend who managed her uh, inventory of her groceries on a spreadsheet. And I thought she was just trying to do it to just be impressive. But no, she was really into that. And, um, but I didn't think about it in that way. So I, through engineering school, I got an internship. I started working in, in work. And I absolutely loved the work. It wasn't until I started leading engineers um, and HR came to us and they said, uh, this. We're, they said, we're going to do a high performance workshop, but that's code for your team's highly dysfunctional. We're here to fix you. <laughs> so if anybody says that to you, hey, we got, we're here to do some team development, I just told you what that really means. <laughs> so we did all these uh, Myers-Briggs Association tests, you know, like personality testing. And that's when I learned that in relation to communication, conflict management change, decision making, and something else. They were all together in the way they thought about it. And I was by myself, I was different. And it was the first time that in my work life interest that I said, oh my God, it's not them, it's me. It's like a relationship, you know? <laughs> it's not you, it's me. And so I, I would like to tell you that it was a beautiful day. It wasn't, I was traumatized. I had spent 10 years working in the field of engineering. Um, my entire background was in engineering. What else was I going to do? Um, and I didn't know what else I would do. And they assigned me a coach, an executive coach. And she worked with me and taught me all how to change myself not to be myself. And my team was really happy. But I didn't even recognize myself in the mirror. And so I was going to quit. I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was going to quit. And I told them that I was thinking about quitting. And they said, well, what are you going to do? 
And I said, I don't know yet. And they said, well, how about this? How about you help us recruit engineers and technical professionals? Um, because I was working in a creative organization. The creative staff didn't work really well with the engineering staff, and they thought I'd be good at getting engineers who could work well with creatives. So that's when I got my first uh, step into HR and realized, oh, I kind of like this, but I'm not like these people either. They like, they mean it when they say our people are our most valuable resource. Eh, not me so much. <laughs> you don't want me leading HR, trust me. So did that for a little while, and then I went back to operations, but as a leader in kind of a sales group, like different kinds of people, all different kinds of people, loved leading in that space. So we're going to talk about that this afternoon. Every, I believe every leader can be a good leader. It's about being in the right spot. I was a horrible engineering manager, absolutely fabulous production manager, same organization. Um, then, so I did that for a while. They did what was called leader-led training, where leaders would come in and do kick off leadership um, training and I got really high scores and so when they asked for somebody to come over to learning and development to lead learning and development I said yes but here's what I'll tell you about how uh, some of our exclusionary practices work and this was in my favor so when I applied for the job in learning and development I didn't have the basic qualifications I'm an engineer right all my background is basically engineering they wanted someone with HR experience learning and development experience so they took the job down, changed the job description so that I could apply for it. Now that worked to my benefit, but it taught me how we do things sometimes to get people we want and to leave out people we don't want, uh, which was very telling for me and when I started doing some of uh, this work. And then when you think about me talking about diversity and inclusion, I went kicking and screaming. I had a client in Iowa, 99.9% .9 white and they wanted me to come do their diversity and inclusion efforts. I'm like, no way. <laughs> I will not do it. And they begged me and begged me and begged me, and I said, okay, I, ch I charged them like double. They still said yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I went and did it. I mean, I'd be there. Uh, lovely people. I have zero to say about Iowans. I cannot figure out how they could be so, like when you look at them, so homogeneous but yet so accepting. It's the most, if you've never been to Iowa, I think you should go, because it's fascinating. It, it stands out. Um, anyway, so I did diver a diversity and inclusion program specifically for them. And for whatever reason, people can hear the message from me. I don't know why. I wish they would like to hear me talk about something else, but they like this. So here I am. That's a long story. Anybody else got any questions? <laughs> Anybody hungry? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> Jamie doesn't have snacks. <laughs> I was looking for Cheez-Its in my little green bag. There aren't any in there. But there's gum. <laughs> if you want the illusion of eating. <laughs> no more questions? Am I releasing them for break? or somebody else. So for those of you who really have questions and you just want to ask me privately, I'll be right here the whole time and you can come up and ask your, your questions privately. And then I'll ask you if we can post your questions later and if you say yes, then everybody else will get to the spirit of your amazing answer. How's that? Okay, thank you.